Again, thank you, thank you all for coming today. We really appreciate it. Um, we want, you know, as, as we let everyone know before, the the main purpose of you know of this meeting is you know we want to engage the restaurant community and food preparation community um, in their interest in some sort of an organics uh, collection program. Um, right now, we're kind of at a pivotal time in um, solid waste strategic planning, and that what we're seeing is we're, we're probably going to see a, a requirement that's going to take us to uh, diverting 75% of our uh, waste stream from, from landfills. It's not a mandate at this time, but uh, AB 341, uh, a Chesbro bill that passed, I believe, back in 2009-2010, had a mandatory recycling component to it. Um, one part of the bill required that all uh, multifamily uh, units and all uh, commercial business accounts that generate four cubic yards or greater are now required to recycle effective July 1, 2011, I believe it was. Um, the city subsequently passed a, a mandatory uh, recycling ordinance that mirrored the requirements of uh, the Chesbro bill. They're, it's, it's the same, so if you generate four cubic yards or greater, um, you are required to recycle. Another, is kind of an add-in in that AB 341 Chesbro bill was that um, it, it did set a goal to achieve 75% uh, land, landfill diversion rate. It was, it's not a mandate, so it's not codified yet. However, uh, Cal Recycle has started to um, Kick, have workshops on getting to the 75% diversion level. Um, on the staff level, we fully expect sooner or later there is going to be legislation that actually makes it mandatory that we get there. You know, we're trying to be proactive and figure out ways that we're going to get there. Um, another reason why we're looking at this right now is um, We've got a landfill disposal agreement with Newby Island Landfill, which is in Milpitas, off of Dixon Landing Road. That's set to expire in 2024. Uh, it sounds like a long time off, but in terms of strategic planning, it's not as far off as we would like it to be. Um, Newby Island, as of right now, has the furthest uh, closure date push out. All the, all the landfill, active landfill sites in the county are currently in San Jose. Um, nothing's permitted to go past 2024 at this time. This, we don't know if San Jose or the landfill operators are even going to pursue uh, extensions to continue to operate. Um, we've got dealers out asking if they plan to extend their, their, their operation past 2024. So far, we haven't gotten any responses on that yet, but um, I'm pretty confident San Jose is probably not going to be permitting any more landfill facilities in the county after everything closes up shop in San Jose. So it, it's going to become imperative for us to figure out how do we handle as much of our waste stream locally because there's going to be quite there's going to be a large charge associated with transporting it to whatever and disposal market that we 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 end up sending it to be it the Central Valley Monterey County's got a landfill that's permitted to be open for quite some time but it it's a it's a long ways off and you know if we if we can figure out a way to handle as much of it locally we can keep costs down as much as possible um, right now you know in order to get to that next tier which is that being 75 percent really the last frontier that we can actually handle without, you know, some sort of extended producer responsibility or change in the way things are, are manufactured is to get at the, the organics, that being largely food waste, um, you know, paper products, that type of thing that's not actually recycled through the, the, the recycling processes right now because there, there's a lot of weight to those currently. That's really the last uh, waste stream out there that's not really being addressed successfully, um, particularly <coughs> locally. A few 
jurisdictions do have programs out there. San Francisco's got a, a food scrap composting program where they actually put out uh, uh, their food scraps in, in a separate container and gets, gets collected separately. So what we want to do right now, you know, from the city's perspective, is be able to gather as much information as we can get right now on what's effective, what works for the residential and business communities as far as what what kind of programs are going to work. You know, we, we can get diversion potentially, but if they're not working for the the community, it's it's not a successful program because we want to uh, have healthy participation and. You know, whatever whatever it is we roll out. So, you know, we're looking at, you know, there's several different models out there, ways to go. One would be the San Francisco model where you're actually doing the, the front end um, sort and putting it out, putting your organic material out in a separate container for collection and processing. You know, that's the, the cleanest way to do it. That's the way you're getting the highest value uh, as far as, uh, feedstock product, but mm -hmm. it requires a lot more work on the uh, on the front end is from the, the the resident or the business as far as sorting it. You know, particularly in a commercial application, uh, space is limited a lot of times, so you may not have additional um, room for uh, an additional uh, container. So that's that's limiting. Um, the constant uh, public education component of it, you know, particularly in the business community or a multifamily unit where you know, the, the, the residents and businesses are more transient in nature. It takes a lot of follow-up um, and effort and that gets costly and it, it, as far as staff time on our end, we're, we're relatively lightly staffed compared to other surrounding uh, communities as far as our ability to do that. Um, <clears throat> another way to do it is uh, you you can collect it um, and, and you can either dirty MRF it, which is take it to a material recovery facility processing, a material recovery processing facility, um, and they run it through an assembly, an assembly line type of process to pull out the or organic material, there's no front end sorting, so your collection costs are significantly lower. That's the, the cheapest way to, to collect it. You're processing a lot of different different type of stuff. Um, the, the quality of the, pro the back end product is not nearly as good because you get contaminants, particularly glass. Um, San Jose is currently doing that with their uh, multifamily garbage. Um, they're actually taking it all to a material recovery facility and trying to, to pull, pull out whatever they can. Um, they've also switched, San Jose has also switched to a, a wet dry program for their commercial sector where it, it pretty much turns your traditional recycling on its ear. It's, instead of what's recyclable and what's not, it's if it's wet and organic, it goes in one container. If it's a if it's you know paper, plastic, whatever type of rigid material goes in the dry. Um, again, it, it it involves relearning processes, um, and you know the jury's still out whether or not that's going to be successful. You know, particularly, you know, with the wet dry system, most of that material, the end use after they process it, it they compost it and it's going to uh, land application. So they're not incorporating it into agricultural uses um, because there is a, a contamination level with glass. It, as more and more communities start to make decisions if they move to that type of processing, we don't know if the market's going to be able to support that. And, you know, costs could go up additionally. Um, I know San Jose's and other jurisdictions are looking at uh, anaerobic digestion plants to handle the organic materials where they, they put it in a, an anaerobic system for a period of time um, as the organic matter decomposes in, into methane. They're using the methane to, uh, and turning that into electricity. Um, again, that's 
you're getting good diversion out of it. It's you know that that technology is very expensive, um, more expensive than composting. So you know it, it's these type of things that we're or, or the type of things that we're looking at. My initial idea with the restaurants was, you know, I kind of like I personally kind of like the the dirty Murph idea where we're you know we're picking up your your waste and you don't really have to think about it. And by targeting restaurants, we're hitting you know loads that um, are very high in, in organic content. So we're it's kind of a, a smart approach to picking what you're going to process rather than handling everybody's that way. Um, and it would give us an opportunity to get some numbers together to see if that you know if that's a direction we're going to want to go in in the future. Um, and the other my my other motivation for it is you know is we're all I'm I'm also responsible for administering our urban runoff pollution prevention program. You know, right now we're looking to try and minimize the use of expanded polystyrene wherever we can. And you know, this our our city's at this time is not open to bans on uh, single use carry out bags or expanded polystyrene, but um, if we can get uh, restaurants to voluntarily discontinue the use of expanded polystyrene in exchange for we're going to give you uh, uh, an organics program at no additional cost, would, would, would the restaurant community be willing to, to, to incorporate the discontinuation of um, expanded polystyrene foam um, from, from the restaurants, and we would be able to take some measure of credit with uh, with the water board for that. We don't know how much that we're mandated to get to forty percent trash load reduction by July 1, 2014. Um, they're still at the water board level scuttling about the accounting system for it, and nobody quite knows how much credit you'll get for any one thing. They're still working it out, but. Um, expanded polystyrene is definitely one of their hot button issues because once it gets into the waterways, um, it breaks down into to little pieces and the wildlife mistake it for food and eat it. So that the, that, that issue is not going to go away anytime soon. Um, so let's see what else do I have. So again, what, the, per, the reason I wanted to, you know, Meet with meet with the restaurant communities. Just basically gauge gauge your interest if you know you want to see some sort of organics collection program, um, and if we were able to do it, because there is going to be a cost associated with it. Anytime you do additional processing, it's you know even though it's not going into the landfill, it is more expensive to go into the landfill. I, through our uh, operating budget. This year, I've requested an additional fifty thousand dollars of of funding that that would be here to to do this type of a pilot to pay for the additional processing, so we can actually gather the knowledge and you know we'll be able to make a, a smarter decision as a community going forward by you know, being able to test things out. And you know, I in my mind, I was wholly convinced. Um, that you know the, the restaurant route and dirty murphing it was the right way to go. Um, I uh, talked with Nubia Island about processing it. They they said, yeah, we think we could take a load, uh, a restaurant load from from you guys. You know, if you get to the point where you're interested, you know, we can talk price. So I don't have processing prices on it. And then I touch base with. Uh, uh, Louis Pellegrini of Mission Trail Waste Systems, because uh, they're going to be collecting it. We need to put together a uh, a program for it to be successful that works for Mission Trail as well. We we don't want to have them going across the entire city to pick up a, a restaurant route. And then when I met with Louis a, a few weeks ago, you know, Louis always Louis one of the most innovative people I know in the solid waste industry, and Louis got some very Good ideas about you know stuff that I I hadn't even hadn't even occurred to me. So I thought you know 
it would be really interesting to have Louie come give the industry perspective of where the solid waste industry is going, and he's got a couple ideas on other things you can do with um, the, the organic waste stream beyond what I've gone over so far today. So with that, I'll turn it over to Louie. <laughs> Are there any questions for Dave right now that he, uh, what he mentioned, or? I mean, pretty much, I mean, we're already going green, and I think a lot of the hotels are right now. So we're already doing the bio things, containers and stuff like that. So we're already kind of heading in that direction. And I have worked with, in San Francisco, Hilton, um, the compost link. So it's just educating the staff and it was successful. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, okay. Anyone else have any questions for right now? Okay. All right. Uh, my name is Louis Pellegrini. I'm one of the owners of Mission Trail Waste Systems, third generation is our name. Involved with Mission Trails for the last 12, 14 years. The contract's good for another eight or ten. So um, there's no real hammer in that law. The hammer's in AB 32, and they're not telling you what it is. It's not the $10,000 a day fine. The law 341 was not on the cities, it's on the generators. That's every one of us in this room that's in business. So the city's kind of removed from it. If the state and the Cal Recycle decides they're going to come out and knock on your door, business, you're not doing what you're supposed to, they're supposed to have some hand. We don't know what that is yet. Most recently, oh, and as Dave mentioned, the Santa Clara Ordinance made it mandatory for commercial recycling business four cubic yards or more. And looking around the room, the, the big hotels here, and I'm not sure of all the other businesses, but the people at RSVP, you're all in that bucket. More than four cubic yards of solid waste generated every week. So you would fall under that. <coughs> One of the services Mission Trail provides to try and entice people to recycle is we'll provide up to 96 gallons of service once a week, free for our customers. Well, that ain't going to help out your big generators, but that's out there. To clarify, Mission Trails is an exclusive hauler for all parcels in the city of Santa Clara that are not zoned industrial, which I think most of the players here fall into that. Any parcel in the city of Santa Clara that is zoned industrial is open competition. So there's a, just wanted to clarify that. <clears throat> this ordinance relates to everybody, I guess. Yes. So. You might have a different hauler. I'm not sure if any of you are hauled by anybody else besides us. So, the latest proposal as of uh, February 12th by Chesborough, same guy that did 341, is directly pointing to organics. Just, odds are it's going to pass this year. He's been trying to do it for a couple of years now. When we say organics, that's the new term, food waste, Green waste, yard trimmings, brush wood, the, the term is organics. A lot of discussions going on right now. Large quantity commercial organics generator. It doesn't specify four cubic yards. In theory, a restaurant near a large organic generator. Significant amounts of organic waste. So by 2017, it might be mandated that organics need to be diverted from solid waste collection. And, and what's in this language, we don't know how it's going to shake out, for separate organics collection. It's almost detailed that you can't do the mix it with other stuff and get it sorted out someplace. We don't know if that will survive in the law. <laughs> Historically, Northern California has source separated collection of all these materials. Southern California has a lot of dirty MRFs. Just for the record, I think businesses in the city of Santa Clara are very fortunate that your solid waste collection rates are probably the cheapest in the county, or if not the Bay Area. The city has done a tremendous job squeezing us down in their uh, <laughs> landfill contract that you have the benefit of the best solid waste collection rates, in my opinion, in, in Northern California. Okay, when it comes to food waste, I, 
food waste organics. I'm just trying to the hierarchy of what you do with this stuff. Source reduction. There's a lot of waste in the restaurant, even in the farming, the quality of the product before it gets at the market. Leftover edible food goes back to homeless shelters or whatever. I'm sure some of that's happening here. No one quantifies that. No one's keeping track of that, but I'm sure it's happening. The third highest one is uh, feed animals. In my grandfather's day, they picked it up, they called it swill, and we fed it to the pigs. Um, they've identified industrial uses. Food waste, that organic fraction, when it creates methane gas through the process, is an energy source. So a lot of tension now is taking the food waste, organic stream, anaerobic digestion, and generate energy. That's something that silicon power here in Santa Clara might be interested with, the sustainability issue. The food waste we generate goes to power, Silicon Valley gets it back to its customers. Composting is kind of the state of the art. Uh, the regulations on that are getting more stringent. Even composting creates greenhouse gases. Open windrows are the cheapest, prevalent. That all might have to go indoors someday because of a uh, greenhouse gases and VOCs through the process. So that cost is going to increase. Currently, the food waste in Santa Clara, except for a few customers that we have and might be happening out there in a non-exclusive area, is being diverted. But the majority of it right now is going to the landfill. Okay, I, on the, two of the sheets there, just a rough estimate. This is from Cal Recyclers, what your entity, depending how you want to look at it, one pound of solid waste per seat per day, 0 0.005 pounds per square foot, 17 pounds per employee, and that was a fast food number. In your waste stream, according to Cal Recycle and studies they've done, 56% of it is food material, organic, compostable, potential energy source, or animal feed. 40% is recyclables. When we talk of recyclables, that's your cardboard, glass, cans, plastic, paper. They do a waste characterization. They sort through it. They look at it. And then they say and only 4% should, should go to the landfill. That's what's driving zero waste. Uh, you, know, you touch everything, do everything right with it you get the minimum amount that needs to go to the landfill. A lot of cities have uh, going down that path. <clears throat> so as uh, Dave mentioned, there's processed the garbage bins for recycling organic materials, food waste, and sent to a mixed waste facility. Or we call it source separated, where we provide you use separate containers, you put some effort into it, then each one of those containers goes to a separate facility. Uh, pros and cons, what's better, what cost. We'll try and get through that through the rest of the presentation, but the majority of the cities in and around San Francisco Bay Area have bought off on this uh, source separated. The Newby Island facility, $50 million in equipment in that building. It's a big test right now, and that's right now dedicated to the city of San Jose's material. So, mixed waste processing, materials recovery, MRF, and if it's, we kind of call it a dirty MRF. They, the people that have those don't like us to use that name, but <laughs> that's what we always call it. So, you collect everything together, you run it through a bunch of equipment, you still end up with manual sorting, and what you get out the end is, what you put in is what you get out. The, the quality of the product <laughs> for recyclable materials, it's got contaminated, so it's not as valuable if you kept it cleaner. The organic material that would go to compost is contaminated with glass. You can't get as high a return at for it as you can if it was source separated. So that's where the economics come into play. Source separated, with three separate containers, and it goes with three different facilities to be handled differently. The equipment cost difference, the productivity is different. So, uh, the efforts on source separating. So historically, we've tried to incentivize the generator to divert the material before we pick it up to the best of their ability. And this is a rough example 
the structure that's in place in Santa Clara right now with our franchise agreement and the current rates. You have a garbage container. I just used a one cubic yard. You guys are way beyond that. Based on that percentages that the state says is in there, if you can achieve that, instead of paying $70.03 a month for a garbage container, if you broke it up into three containers, the footprint's about the same as the garbage container. So the space issue in this situation is about equal. You get the garbage down to the bare minimum. We provide the first 96 gallons free. There's no cost. And the organics rate per the per agreement is what it is. So going from this, you put in some effort, your monthly bill, you're going to save $35.19. You're going to save 49% on your cost if you had a one cubic yard. That changes based on other parameters. But that's where historically pay as you throw, if you divert it properly, you can save money. Help offset some of your internal costs from doing it with the material separately. Um, the estimated processing costs for these different systems, and one of the reasons that source separated pay as you throw, current landfill cost being around this area is $45 a ton. If it goes to the landfill, that's what it costs to bury it forever. You send it to a dirty MRF, the numbers that I've been quoted right now is $80 a ton. And you don't get anything back. They, they got to handle it a bunch of times, got a big investment, and they try to market the material. It's not the best quality material. That blue cart, or the blue container and all the mix, after we collect it, after we process it, after we market it, there's about $30 a ton on the plus side to us as a hauler. That's what we use to offset the cost for collecting materials. Right now, if I had a clean stream of material directly to compost, that tip fee is $44 a ton. And the latest and greatest is animal fee. And this is where I'm kind of hanging my hat right now that I see a real potential. This is food waste. In your restaurant, in your kitchen, what you throw in that container, handled properly, processed properly, is it was human grade food when it went in. The nutritional value of this material, meeting all FDA specs for, in the old days when it was swill, we had to cook it for to 212 degrees for 30 minutes before it would you could feed it back to animals. New processes eliminate that. This is 60% of the nutritional value of this dog bone, milk tree. So, you know, we say nothing's new. The technology now where we fed it to the pigs, we can take that same stuff and get it into a quality that could go back to feeding pigs, pet food, chicken food. There's a higher and better use, a higher value for that material now versus composting it and turning it into soil amendment and dirts. So I quoted roughly $30. You know, there's some savings there. We're working through this process. So I think we're on to something, and that's why I'm promoting source separations of the organics material to get it to a higher value end product to help offset the cost of collection instead of taking the, the easier route out. Um, the anaerobic digestion, if that food waste into a, a technology that turns it into methane and gas, there's some added value to that. The economics are still, there's one facility in Monterey that's just opening up. Over in Germany, it's prevalent because landfills are banned in Germany. There's no landfills. The energy sells for 19 cents a kilowatt. So the, the government's really controlling why they can do that. That technology is coming over here. There's a pilot in Monterey. There will be one in uh, South San Francisco. We're looking at another one. So that food waste and the green waste could go into another technology. That cost is going to be somewhere right around here, I think. But that energy value is what's in. What, what is energy going to cost in five or six years? There's carbon credits. There's all kinds of offsets if it comes to renewable energy. So... What future 
collection <laughs> system cost will be, we don't know. That's with the city. We want to go out and try things, see what works best. Um, we have source separated collection in our other cities. Um, Mission Trail also services Los Altos. We have Alameda, San Leandro, Livermore, where we've implemented source separated collection. Mission Trail is available to help train your staff people, provide you in house containers, um, do the collection, and it's currently available in the current uh, system. So, uh, Denise is our outside salesperson there to come and contact you. Yvette puts out all the fires as our <laughs> operations. Um, everybody, big generator should have received a notice about 341. I don't know what the next step is. We haven't had a whole bunch of response. If you have any recycling in place now, whether it's through your hauler or you're doing your own, you're probably somewhat in compliance. You are. <laughs> and there's some people that don't have any recycling at all that we're aware of. At least needs to be documented that they're doing something on their own. So there's a lot of work to be done. These laws are coming down, and uh, we want to be here to be part of it and provide good service and look into the future. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I have posters <laughs> here if anybody wants it. And, uh, like I said, Denise could help you. No, oh, thanks, Louie. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm, I'm very happy I invited Louie to come talk today because he uh, said I, I always enjoy meeting with Louie. He always learn something new when I sit down with him. And you know, there are lots of different perspectives out there. You know, nobody at this point in time knows what's right. And, and you know, there could be a series of of right solutions. But you know, for for me, you know, looking toward for the city's long term interest, I I, I want to be able to make a smart decision on how we go forward in the future. Um, so again, we're here to engage the community to find out, you know, what at what level of activity are you willing to 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 do to to get a program like this off the ground as far as, you know, will you source separate, would you or would you rather it be collected straight from the container? Um, would you voluntarily discontinue the use of expanded polystyrene? So on the, for those of you who don't have them yet, we do have the little half-page sheets. It's just a brief questionnaire, and again, it's just it's just designed to, to gauge your interest. Because again, we want to we want to put out a a, a program that the community is going to want to participate in. So if you can get us that feedback, that would be great. Also, back there is just you know I, I printed out some information on you know substitutes for expanded polystyrene if you're moving away from expanded polystyrene, you know, you need to find something else out. The alternatives are a little bit more expensive. There's some price information on that data. Um, well, I, I don't know how current it is. I think 2011 is the last thing that was published there. Um, I don't know if anybody read the, the Mercury News today or saw on, online. City of San Jose is going to move forward with an expanded polystyrene ban in their city if it passes it would make it the uh, largest city in the United States to, to move forward with an expanded polystyrene ban. Um, let say, when I went to Louis' office back on the, uh, the kibble thing, he had a, a Mavitech video uh, on the um, uh, agenda talking uh -huh. points. We don't have it. Okay. Well, I put, I put the link on it oh. in case you're interested in looking at it. Um, it's pretty fascinating. It's basically like a, a almost like a corkscrew that just presses the, the material through um, and, you know, or, an organic, a compostable uh, foodware type of product would actually be able to be processed through that, that technology, whereas a, an expanded polystyrene one would not. Um, I also just it, it just came out uh, a few days ago, um, as far as legislation that may be of interest to you. Uh, Senate Bill 529 uh, from Leno um, hit the docket last week, I think on February 22nd. Um, it prohibits the distribution of disposable food service packaging and single-use carryout carry bags effective 
July 1, 2014. Um, if that interests you or affects your business, you may want to, to follow that. There's a couple other environmental bills that are on the docket right now. We went over one of them, but I figured that was probably the one that, you know, for, for this audience would be the of the most interest. Um, if you're interested in getting a copy of it, just you know, contact me. I've I've got it uh, downloaded, and they tend to go through several iterations before they actually get voted on. So what the, the information I've got as it was in, initially introduced with no no changes yet. So. Um, again, thank you for the opportunity. Um, it's nice to be able to get out and talk about this. The, the, everything I do in my job, this is my favorite part. Um, getting to, to talk about garbage and recycling sounds funny, but um, <laughs> as I get busier and busier, I always enjoy this the most. So thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to uh, attend this, and thank you, Steve, for setting this up. I very much appreciate it. And again, if you could fill out those half-sheet evaluations, um, that, that would help us out a lot. Maybe if, uh, would everybody be comfortable just giving you your initial response to the two options that uh, were, were presented today as far as um, uh, the, the, I guess the dirty, uh, what do you call it, the dirty, dirty murph, murph, dirty murph for the separation. Um, what's your feelings about that? If we can go around the room. Yeah. <laughs> Well, over at the Hilton in Santa Clara, we're doing a lot of the recycling, but the, the food has always been one that we've always looked at or thought about. Because we do like our French fry grease, but now if we put another one of those uh, one cubic yard containers on our parking lot, what about the rodents? You know, uh, how often are, are we going to be on a pickup schedule where right now Mission Trail comes every other week? versus weekly because we've been able to condense a lot of our trash. Uh, try and give a short answer. Food waste, garbage, anything that would rot, the term is protressable. Per county ordinance, health and safety rules, anytime there's protressable, in theory you're supposed to service it minimum once a week. Over time, those of you who have those big compactors, putting it in there and pulling it every other week, sometimes once a month. I won't talk about the one restaurant, <coughs> but our drivers don't want to pick up because they only pull it once a month. <laughs> but because it's contained in whatever, environmentally, safety, if you've got a problem, that county health department's going to be all over you. Those of you that don't have compactors, you have your garbage bin out in the parking lot. That same material is in the garbage bin, and those are picked up once a week, multiple times. So my quick response is, it's the same material. You got it out there now, you're just putting it in a different container. Will it attract more rodents? I don't know. It's got to be the right container. It has to be sealed. It has to be kept clean. You know, that we promote the use of the carts. That organic fraction. Your garbage density the way it is is maybe 100 pounds <coughs> a cubic yard. When you separate out that wet stuff, you're talking <coughs> four or 500 pounds a cubic yard. It's a lot heavier, a lot denser. You can't, nobody can maneuver it in a big container anymore. So we like the carts. They're easy to clean, they're easy to be rolled. They're pretty much rodent proof. You know, uh, it'll take a while for a rat to chew through it. We keep the lid down, keep it locked. The majority of the city, I implemented these programs in 2002 in some of our cities, and it works. You know, that's a question that always comes up. Well, if, my short if, if I had a bigger container, then I don't have to worry about the transients, you know, the people coming in and just throwing their garbage mm -hmm. out of all miscellaneous stuff. Because we tried the smaller containers, but we found people use them for garbage cans. We've had some customers where the compactor, everything, you sort out everything else and leave the compactor for the food waste. You know, that, it, it, it's reversing the whole thought process, you know, and it's the biggest part of the material you have by the statistics. So uh, separate the other stuff, keep that nasty, icky material in that compact. It depends on your situation. And new containers are being designed to help alleviate some of the problems we're talking about. Scavenging, theft, illegal dumping, that's another social issue. <laughs> yeah, All right. Thanks.
<coughs> when we started sorting, you know, like I think like everybody else, um, and we are still changing our containers and stuff to the bio stuff. Right. So it's coming. Yeah. Well, there's so no a, issues with separation. Yeah. Okay. No, I mean they separate. Right. I mean the housekeepers, everybody's they're already in that mm -hmm. sink mode. I was going to say, I think I've talked to every one of you guys sitting here at the at the table at one point or another, um, at one point time or another, but there's always an issue with cost associated with it. So that's, I mean, I think everyone's heart's in the right place and everybody wants to do the right thing, but bottom line is it's not a cheap process at this time and not everybody's participating in it. So there is a cost associated with it. And so I think that's been a big deterrent otherwise. Yeah. You guys well, are we, get, we get guests who will ask us, are you a, a green hotel? Mm -hmm. So yeah, you have to go in that direction. Yeah. From a yeah. hauler standpoint, you look back 15, 20 years ago, look, use your residential neighborhood. One truck went down, everything went into one truck. Now there's three trucks going down. Well, it's the same amount of material, we're just picking up three different weights. There needs to be that shift, on, especially on the commercial side. The trucks are coming there now. We're going to keep coming with the trucks. We're just going to shift it, different materials in different trucks. Um, we're in this transition mode right now. You know. So it will be four trucks. Uh, <laughs> uh, mostly three trucks is what we're running. Right now on a commercial, I'd say two trucks, garbage and then those, recyclables. Those commercial generators have the landscaper off, off all of them. Mm -hmm. They'll take it with them. Yeah. Yeah. So that's actually, oh, this is going for me, so. <laughs> but it's to, to Denise's point, that we're not asking for any, you know, additional rate increase for this. We're, we're looking to roll this out as a pilot where, you know, essentially the cities would be looking to ab absorb the additional cost through the pi pilot program just to get this started so we can look at numbers and make smarter decisions, you know, when it's going to cost a lot more money down the road. I mean, there's going to be environmental benefit to, to implementing a, a program like this, and there's certainly going to be costs, but right now, you know, what we're trying to do is just get a participation base just so we can get some some data to analyze and see, you know, if we did go the source separated route, is it working? Are we having any problems with contamination? How difficult has it been to, to educate people? Or if you go the the uh, dirty murph route, where you know it's it's a seamless program. You know we we'll, we'll want to look at how much glass is in the finished product, and you know the, there are definitely concerns about you know what's going to happen to that product uh, uh, down the road as you get more and more of it and you run out of uh, land application. So you know we don't know if technology is going to be developed that's going to clean that up in the future. So there's, there's a lot of moving parts. What enticed me about this technology, I don't know how many have pets, but the smelt bone, do you know what it retails for a ton? $12,000 a ton. Wow. $6 a pound for this dog treat. And this is 60% of what went into this. So that's... So if you all compost, you can all go get to a dog at the Humane Society. <laughs> so, so Dave, when, uh, if, if you get some buy-in here, it sounds like you, you may, when are you thinking about instituting the pilot program? Sometime after July 1st. Again, I, I've also, there's so many moving parts with this. I've got to get permission from uh, the city, you know, essentially to roll this out. And, you know, okay. The way I've incorporated this is I've included, you know, loading $50,000 into the solid waste budget for a, some sort of program. We don't know what it would look like, so, you know, I would hope that it will get approved. It may not, but, yeah. you know, the, I, I don't want to, you know, keep going forward if there's not the interest amongst the, right. the community to implement something. So there's a lot of moving parts, and July 1st would be an overly, probably an overly optimistic uh, uh, start date, but it, no, nothing before July 1st. Okay, I think this... Yeah, so how much is going to cost the after that? Or it's going to be... Um, um, after the pilot's finished, if we, you move forward, yeah, I think is what your question is. Um, yeah, yeah. We haven't set up a beginning or end date for the pilot. I 
would want a pilot to go for at least three years. Um, hope by that time, you know, we may be, you know, based on the legislation Louie showed, um, we may be required to put something into place even before that. But you know, I, I would like to, you know, get something in there, see how it works, and you know, I think if we are able to generate a successful pilot, whatever the program is. Once we've demonstrated success, and you know, if customers are happy with it, it, it will be easier to expand. And at that time, you would probably you would then try and broaden the, the base to, to recoup the cost because the, the city you know does want to to have the uh, solid waste program fees pay for all the solid waste programs. Um, I was intrigued by Louis's uh, kibble idea. idea um, he was saying when he was talking to me about it, he was saying that they're uh, mobile and basically in the back of trailers, easy to to set up. If we could find some place to set one up around here, that would certainly be a, a revolutionary for this area. Um, I I was definitely I, definitely interested by that. I, I was definitely leaning towards the dirty murph before going in and talking to Louis. But after talking with Louis, I kind of had a little change of heart, which. But this is yeah, there, there is no one right now. Six okay. months the dog was out on this technology to be on the street. Mm -hmm. so, so. Well, that, yeah. Go ahead. So as my counterparts says the Hilton as well as the Plaza Streets and to try and do as much as we can to be green, but we'd definitely be interested in participating in the pilot program and having separate containers that sounds like it's quite the most logical way to go. Thank you. There isn't any Burger King or IKEA operators in here, is there? So, no. no <laughs> just that, that joke, sorry. Um, <clears throat> no, uh, it's it's great to see that this is finally coming to fruition here in the city of Santa Clara. Obviously, participating in the San Francisco um, program up there, it's it's a form of habit. You, my staff, you know, at first it was a little painful to get them educated in the process, but once you start to educate and teach them, it's second nature to them. They all know how to separate. They all know how to get it to where it needs to be. Um, so, you know, I, I'm in, on board of separating. Okay. We'd be interested to, you know, get things going, but you know, at the Hyatt, we've so restricted the space that it's very difficult. We, I mean, we've tried to get other programs off the ground, but it's just been very difficult. But if we can, you know, discuss this and, and figure out a solution, we're, we're open to you know, we're, we're open. You know, we all kind of got space growing up in the valley, and it used to be a lot of spaces, more and more and less space. You go look at New York City, some you know, everyday collection, I see that happening, you know. Instead of letting it stockpile, we got to be prepared. Our trucks are running every day. So one of the things we haven't really pursued is if it's a real space problem, be there every day. I serve at Stanford <coughs> University. I'm going in sometimes twice a day to move stuff out just because there is no space. The How space is more valuable. How far away is the, I, I know where Hyatt's guard, uh, back pad is where all of your solid waste services are at. I, I'm trying to think where the convention center is at. How far away is it? If, if From you the Hyatt? If you could down share down. It, it's not uh, too far containers. Away. Yeah, no. Yeah, being it, well, that would take a little more research, but it just, I'm just trying to think outside the box mm -hmm. for it. <laughs> yeah, we're, Cause I, I know you're very so limited. Exactly. Just down though. Ramp or yeah, exactly. Road. <laughs> I think the separate container would be great. Now, I mean, when we're done with the end, of, at the end of the day, I need two people just to take the 55 gallon drum out and dump the thing out. We just leave it there, close the lid, and then you can take it. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> we for it. Built more. We'll do it. The only question I have you mentioned uh, Burger King. What about Safeway? The Safeway has a unique program. All their stores, all the uh, vegetables, all they backhaul that to their main distribution center, and there they get it off to composting. So they've been way ahead on that, but they use their own their own trucks come in and they're self hauling it back, so they're not in violation of the franchise agreement. So some of those big chains like that are have already stepped up and are handling this material separately outside of the normal hauler in the community. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. I think we've gotten a, a lot of good feedback. And again, if we get your, get those half sheets back from you, so we've got 
you know, points of contact, and we do hopefully eventually start reaching out uh, to implement a program. Um, we definitely want to bring on board those that are interested. Again, li potential limiting factors is you know we have to make this work for for Mission Trail as well. So we're going to have to figure out a way to geographically cluster accounts. So you know, everybody who wants to participate may not necessarily be able to participate, you know, be, but, you know, we want to try and offer it to as many people that we, that want to do it as possible. Um, so we'll definitely keep you posted. And again, thank you very much for for coming. Your, your uh, feedback to us is very important in making these uh, program decisions. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.